All right, we're back. Episode number 008, the Daru Strong Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Daru. Today, I had the pleasure of talking with Mr. or Dr. Jordan Shallow, the muscle doc, doctor of chiropractic, a very accomplished lifter, strong dude, and he kind of looks like me, so it was fun to talk to him. I was on his podcast about a week ago, so I had to get him on to talk shop. Listen, pay attention to what this man says. He's very intelligent. He has a lot of knowledge to drop. So make sure you keep your eyes open and keep your notebooks out to to take notes. And uh, we'll go from there. But first, I want to make sure that I go ahead and shout out the sponsors. All right. So first one is going to be the Revive MD supplement line, revivesubs.com. Revive is a top of the line supplement company that I personally recommend to all my athletes because of the quality, the minerals, the nutrition, and they test their ingredients fully before, you know, bringing it out there for the public. So you guys know how anal I am about optimizing performance and mitigating fatigue. And this health and performance is what I really truly want to get out of the, the supplements that we have. That's why I personally take my own athlete stack that I created with Revive to help my athletes along with myself to get better performance and to recover properly. So if you guys click the link below and use the discount code DRUSTRONG20, you'll get 20% off in the entire store, including my personal athlete stack like I talked about, which is, again, going to be enhancing recovery but also increasing performance. So check it out. All right. Also, if you want to get my free MMA off-camp program, it's going to be completely free if you go ahead and go on to the youtube page if you go on to the youtube page for the darushan podcast hit subscribe so you can get a chance to take on my six-week mma off camp program where we're going over the basis behind building a solid work capacity strength endurance mobility and overall conditioning so check it out make sure you go ahead subscribe to the daru strong youtube channel and uh i'll see you there hopefully you can get some questions out of me if you have any just DM me, let me know, but we're going to make this thing happen, all right? And now, on to the show. Welcome to the Strong Podcast. Strong Podcast. Let's go! Mind over matter. Put your mind somewhere else and keep going. That little voice in your head is trying to stop you from getting to where you want to be. Be successful and keep moving forward. With your host and world What's up, Jordan? How you doing, brother? Yeah, I'm doing well, man. I'm with yourself. <laughs> we're good, man. See, he's laughing because we kind of were talking for the past 15 minutes, but I made it seem like we just started talking. So, uh, so all right, man. You know, people, uh, and we, it's funny because I just was on your podcast too. People were saying that, you know, we look alike. We kind of act alike. Uh, we got similar views on things. But for the people that don't know who you are, which is highly unlikely, but I'm just going to go ahead and humor myself. Go ahead and give them like a little background story of yourself and, and how you got started working with such elite level power lifters and also with the clinical side and everything that you're doing with that. Uh, yeah, so um, my name is Jordan Shallow. I, I grew up in a, a small town in southwestern Ontario. Uh, I uh, did my undergraduate in kinesiology uh, in Toronto and I moved out to California to go to chiropractic college in like 2012. And mm -hmm. honestly, man, as far as the powerlifting goes, like, I didn't even know what powerlifting was. Mm -hmm. I just went through school and I was always a bit of a meathead and, you know, kept lifting weights going through grad school and uh, one thing kind of led to another. And um, as I graduated school and started kind of my first job in like the, we'll call it like the corporate world, um, I, I met this dude named Dan Green and, mm -hmm. you know, he was just a really, I didn't know, yeah, like I didn't really know about like squat, bench and deadlift. I didn't know you could compete at that and he's tried to like, you know, started talking and I started to watch him lift and I started to treat him a bit and, and all of a sudden, I set up an office in his gym, and yeah, that was like kind of what kickstarted all this. Yeah. 2015, and fast forward five years later, and yeah, here we are. Yeah. So, what was like the first like uh, when you met Dan? Like, what was the first thing you said? Because you, obviously, he's a big dude, you know, and he's strong. But did you know about him like at all, or you just kind of went in there like, oh, this powerlifter guy? Type deal. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I knew of him by the time he sort of like crossed my desk. Like I, mm -hmm. I got into it. I was kind of like preface, like you know, it was through a mutual friend. Um, you know, he's having he was having some issues. He went to one of his training partners, who's also like a bigger guy. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it, a lot of times it can just be like a logistics thing with like manual therapy and like you know how it is with athletes, man. Like you know, he, he's gonna walk into most 
most offices and they'd be like, oh, it hurts doing this. Just stop doing that. It's like, well, you know, he's the best at the world at doing that. So he's not going to stop doing it. So, um, so his friend, like our mutual friend kind of like tipped me off. And then I started to see him on social. I was like, oh, okay, this is, this guy's no joke. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, he, he came in, man. And like, it's just, it, it just becomes like a, like almost like a levers thing where like, I know plenty of good Kairos and PTs that aren't, you know, six foot 270, but you know, it, and you don't have to be that, but for me and dealing with someone like that, it definitely helps to be able to kind of be in the same weight class as him. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's just the thing with that, man. And like we riffed on this last week is like, I think an understanding with athletes like that from like, almost like, like an empathetic level. Mm -hmm. Like I've been hurt lifting weights and like, I, I'm like, a, you know, not like I'm a bigger guy and I kind of, I understand to a certain degree what training like that does to your body. But like, I, I think the biggest thing for me was just kind of having that experience of like, okay, like it's not really like the muscle that I'm like worried about or the tendon or the ligaments. Mm -hmm. It's more like the nervous system and the personality. Like that mm -hmm. was really where I think like, you get a lot of buy-in in the stuff that you do where it's like, you know, I'm under, I'm under the same bars. Uh, I'm deadlifting. Like, you know, I, I'm kind of in that day to day with them. So I think that was, that's the biggest thing with working with athletes at a higher level was like, it's, you got to understand like the personality first, but also like what it does to like your body and especially your central nervous system. Mm -hmm. You're just, it's just something different. Like when yeah. that walks in the door, you're like, okay, everyone in this waiting room is kind of a human being. But if we were like, you know, if we were going to do this from like a taxonomy standpoint and we were starting to like pick apart like, OK, sub classifications and phylums and kingdoms, it's like that one is different. <laughs> you just start to realize just there's just different people like yeah. they're just they're just sure. not like like they're not like other people. <laughs> so I've been lucky to kind of build a practice even now, like remotely with some of the guys I work with. Mm -hmm. mostly kind of in the NFL and you just start to realize that, and you with fighters like and the fighters that I've come across is like they're just they're just wired different and people say that mm -hmm. and it and I've heard it before I started working with these guys but it like it it's not like a it's not like a parable it's not just like a thing when you work with these guys you're like they're like superheroes it's like some men in black shit you're like what the <laughs> fuck was that yeah so, yeah it's just they're like us. We always say like you, they got a special type of crazy, you know, and uh, it's a, the elite of the elite are, are super out there in a way, in a way they think and, and how they act. And that's that's kind of their normal because, you know, regular people's normal is not the way they act. That's why they're not in the position that the elites are in, you know, so it makes sense. It's crazy. Though. Yeah. And once like once you kind of like and it's they're all they're, they're different normals are all different from one another like yeah. but you you just you know when you cross that threshold that you're like okay like this dude will run through walls to get better mm -hmm. like and most people won't even like set an alarm in the morning or eat breakfast and it's like this yeah. guy and, and across the board man with like all the like the higher end athletes i work with it's and that's where like the the, the empathy comes in it's like for most people in a clinical setting what I need to do is to get them to do the things they don't want to do. When you deal with an elite level athlete is getting them to do less, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. they just like, what can I do? Like, what can I do? What can I do? And so it's like, fuck, like, oh, like chill, man. Like, come on, you do it. Don't you think you do enough? Yeah. But uh, that's, that was my first exposure to just like, just a different creature, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because when I started working at ATT as a coach, you know, I thought, the same way I would think if working with General Pop when I was working with them, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to motivate these guys and really get in them. And, or like even like with high school football, like it's a little different there, you know what I mean? And you need to kind of motivate those guys sometimes because they're kids. But these guys, it's like, and I don't need to do any of that. I don't even remember the last time I had to yell, you know, and just really just, the main thing that I need to do is make sure that everything is on point from a structure standpoint. And then also making sure I'm pulling them back because they're gonna, they're going to end up overtraining themselves no matter what. So I'm pretty sure you go through that, especially with the elite level powerlifters. You've worked with, we work with hockey too, right? Or is that something? That yeah. You uh, yeah. Hockey, NFL, uh, powerlifting, some, some mixed martial arts. 
Yeah, yeah. I was because I was gonna say like that. That uh, hockey background that you have probably helped you out when it came down to work ethic and things like that. Because you're building a solid business right now. You're, you're traveling around the world. You're doing seminars, bro. That's that's phenomenal. You're stuck in Australia right now, which is fucking insane. But it's not that bad, right? <laughs> I mean, you could be in Can you could be in Canada right now, and I think is it cold out there now? It's pretty cold. Right? It shouldn't be, but dude, it snowed last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not complaining. Yeah. So, so what made you get into like the clinical side of things? Like, I know you went to chiropractic school, but what made you start that? Like, was it something that you did in, in college or stuff that you did in high school and was like, yeah, man, I, I really want to help people or? What right. Yeah. So, as, oddly enough, like from a career standpoint, man, my initial trajectory out of high school is I wanted to be a history professor. So wow. I started my undergrad. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> yeah, so I so I started. My, it would have been the, would have been the, the the most jack fucking history teacher in the game. <laughs> so yeah, I started studying like I was like doing a double major in history and political science, and mm -hmm. then you know what I was playing hockey. I was like playing at like a higher level, like kind of ascending the ranks in the junior levels, and then I uh, yeah I, I was a personal trainer at the same time and studying history and I, I mean i like the content like i still like all my extracurricular stuff i still read is all like mm -hmm. you know world war ii history stuff nice. but i just it was just the people man like i walked into a lecture hall and i would just look and i'd have like my six pack meal bags and i'd have my flex magazine down one side and my shaker cup <laughs> and i got like five meals for like a three-hour class and everyone's like i don't know and like hey you know but whatever floats your boat, that just like, it wasn't like, those weren't my people, man. Like I walked in and, you know, they were all super nice, but like, we just like, there was nothing other than like, Hey, yeah, we, 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 we kind of, we jam on history a little bit and that's it. Mm -hmm. And like, there was just a disconnect from like, like a people side. Yeah. And I was like, it was kind of a, it was a tough decision. And then like at the same time while I was training, one of my, one of my training partners, the guy who actually got me into serious weight training, one of his clients, that he was training at the time was a chiropractor mm -hmm. super nice dude like really well respected in the community and like you know we chat him up here and that here and there and like you know he kind of similar business model you, you see people you shorter amount of time makes more money he drives a range i like ranges i was like all right sweet and i just started talking to him about it and so i did two years history of political science and i was like you know what I, I don't think i can i can be in this network of people anymore like it's kind of there's no, there's no, yeah. the interaction, like it's just a disconnect. Like I go to, I go to school, I sit there, I take notes, I go train, I go home, I go play hockey. And that was it. Mm -hmm. I was like, I, I need more than that. And then, so then I switched gears after two years into history and political science. And then I sort from history and political science into, um, into like kinesiology and, and mm -hmm. then was able to finish my undergrad in, in the additional two years. So I think the biggest thing for me was like, you know, just, getting hurt when I was playing hockey and going to see clinicians and getting better. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I had, I blew both my medial meniscus playing hockey. I was a goalie and one bad play. I, you know, I was on crutches. I couldn't get out of like the car when I got home. I was like, fuck, like, that's it. Like you're done. Probably had to get surgery. And I, I went to this chiropractor, obviously like not like conventional type because he was working with like knees and stuff like that. Most people think like spine. And that's what I thought too, man. Like, yeah. Like, I don't know, like, I don't have a headache. Like, why would I go see a chiropractor? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, like, I was back on the ice in, like, three weeks. And I was like, fuck, man, like, this dude, there's something to this. Like, there's this dude just took me from, like, I think I have to get surgery to, you know, I, I'm back playing and doing the stuff that I like to do. And, nice. and further than that, he was, you know, it wasn't just about pain, which I really liked about this dude. It was about performance. Mm -hmm. So, like, he's trying to help me, like, you know, hey, what are you doing for your training? Like, what are you doing for, like, what do you think of off season? What do you do in season? Things like that. I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I just, I rollerblade in the off season and I play hockey in season. Like, what, it's going to be that difficult. So, I was like, okay, this is, I think this is something that I want to do. At, at the very least, like, it's just totally autonomous. So, mm -hmm. then got into chiropractic college. And then I think the biggest thing for me was just training as I was learning. Like, you know, we, we would have almost a year in a cadaver lab. You spend three hours cutting open dead bodies and being like, oh, shit, this inserts here. Like, well, this isn't – wait, the arteries aren't blue and the veins aren't red or whatever the hell. Like, this is all just a jumbled mess. Yeah. And, like, you see it and it's so visceral, eh? Like, you just look at it. It's like, holy shit. Like, this dude had a social security number and, like, a dog three days ago. And I'm cutting his face open like Ed Gia in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's like, this is, but then you go in and you train and it's like, 
you know, we always, you, you grow up and you hear like the mind muscle connection thing. And it's like, okay, talk, but then, talk a little bit about you, that, please. <laughs> talk right, a little bit about that, right? See, well, that was the thing, man. Like, and like, I do Flex Magazine, muscular development every month. I was the biggest meathead kid you'd ever meet in your life. Like, <laughs> I would like, I would not go out with my friends because I had to train. Like every stereotype you could imagine, I was it, mm-hmm. and still am to a, to a large degree. And I remember saying mind muscle connection, but I realized that it wasn't until. I got into chiropractic college and I was cutting open dead bodies and I was starting to like, you know, train a lot more intensely. That's all. I moved to California, didn't know a soul. You know, I had like the shirt on my back and I moved into a place and that was it. Yeah. So I was like, right, I'm just going to go train and keep my head down for a few years and, and, and knock it out and, and, and get to work. But like that mind muscle connection, I think that's what started to connect a lot of dots for me was like, oh, it's not just because like I feel my biceps when I do this. Your bicep has like, okay, what does that insertion actually look like? Is it like fans onto the radius? You know, when it attaches to the two points of the shoulder, like on the, like on the infraglenoid or supraglenoid part of the scapula and the coracoid process, like where, where does that, how does that traverse? What are the muscle fibers look like? What innervates it? Yeah. So it's like, you know, and that to me, I was like, oh, I've had a muscle mind connection this whole time. I've just done bicep curls, like Branch Warren's YouTube videos. And then I felt my biceps and I was like, oh, I can feel this. Like I'm connected to this, you know, like, yeah, this mind muscle. You guys got to have that mind muscle connection. Right? Yeah. It's like you're seeing God doing hammer curls or some shit. And it's just like, oh, and then I realized it's like, that was a muscle mind connection, right? Like the, the afferent or afferent was driving my efferent. I was training the way I was training because that's the way I train. Then as I started to learn more about like the physiology to the anatomy to the biomechanics, I was like, oh, there's so much more to like bicep end ranges and wrist yeah. position and, you know, pronation versus supination of varying parts of the range and applying different like dumbbell versus cable versus, you know, uh, barbell, like all these different anatomical differences from person to person. Like, okay, now I'm thinking. Now I'm starting with the mind. I'm mean, actually have like a mind muscle connection. I know yeah. everything there is to know about a, a biceps muscle. Yeah. Now, when, when I started to train, it was it was a lot more effective. Like you know, you go you go through school and it's a fairly like arduous program. It feels like you're just writing tests for like four years straight. Yeah. So I was like, my my workouts got really short like you know 45 minutes every other day maybe like you know okay. you're trying to study i got a bike i was on my bicycle yeah. felt like a 10 speed felt like a bear yeah. in the circus like cruising down the side of, <laughs> try not to get hit that's a big that's a big fucking guy riding a bicycle man i'm telling you right now <laughs> my days on bicycles are gone <laughs> man um, but yeah so that was that was kind of it man like and starting to piece together like you know, I had a bit of a strength and conditioning background as well. I did some stuff yeah. while I was in undergrad, and uh, I was doing some volunteering at Palo Alto High School at the time when I got to California. And so I kind of started to look at things through like three lenses, like that clinical lens, but also like you know a strength and conditioning lens. But I think most importantly, that athlete lens, right? Mm-hmm. So I can look at a at a at a at a at an issue, at some sort of dysfunction or injury or pathology or whatever you want to call it, through three lenses. You know, the, this clinical, this S and C coach side, but also, but also I think most importantly, like that, that third eye, that athlete, that athlete lens. So kind of creating almost like this prism and how I looked at issues. It was just, yeah. and as I had these three entry points of looking at things, it just gave me like a lot deeper perspective. Yeah. So, and I started to just consider therapy a lot different as I was going through school. Cause they teach you. They basically, they teach you a way to pass the board exams, and mm-hmm. those are ways so you can help the most amount of people. Mm-hmm. They don't teach you how to, like, you know, coach and treat and train, you know, world class athletes. So yeah. it's it took kind of like my own experience, keeping up with the research, uh, and then like going out and being able to work with these people one on one, but also my my own training at the same time to be like start to establish a bit of an ethos around. Okay, how is it that we structure? rehabilitation and injury risk management for this different tax taxonomy of, of, of person of athlete, right? Like these elite mm-hmm. level athletes, like where do we fall short in our remedial approaches mm-hmm. that like people are learning in school, like progression for a, like a, a proper athlete. Isn't like, 
yellow TheraBand to like green TheraBand or whatever, right? Like we got to think a little bit more true to the actual sport. So yeah, yeah that was kind of the big thing for me is putting those three pieces together. Yeah, you bridge the gap, and that's something that a lot of people can't do. I see a lot of like clinical guys or a lot of guys coming out of school. They have that, that baseline knowledge, even from the micro level, but they can't put it together when you step out on the floor and have to actually coach a guy or a girl or whoever, especially at the elite level, because you have to have some, some level of authority you know, and, and, and know how, and, and they have to respect you too. Even though you have you know, letters behind your name, at the end of the day, you better have that ability to coach them and actually get in touch with what they need, you know? Um, what I wanted to ask you was, um, fuck, like, so with the, the exercises that, let's say, for instance, you see, let's say on social media, because we know some of those are bad, right? Obviously. So what would, you, what, would you, what would you say is the biggest problem right now when it comes to social media and the way you should or that is portrayed on what you should be doing because i know you have obviously that 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 practical application and you, you have uh your own thoughts on that too as well so i want to one of the pick your brain on that one i mean social media dep i guess it would depend honestly on what the medium is right like instagram is has a different set of problems than youtube a different set of problem than not so much podcast but like mm -hmm. you know what is instagram for like the attention span is so small like they're just looking for that click they're just looking for that follow that 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 uh that turn on post notifications or shares like you know if you run a business and you're in the fitness industry you know how to look at insights on a story mm -hmm. so you can start insights on a post so you're like you know you start to look at things in a way like all right well this post did well it was about this we posted on this time this day it reached a percentage audience that wasn't already following me you know and so i think what people do is they start to look just at like the numbers on the back end and that just leads them to sensationalism mm -hmm. right like it just leads them to doing like yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to name names, but like, there's just stuff out there. Like, you know, people doing bicep curls against no resistance. Like just what to get some likes and follows. Like, what are you doing, man? Like, I, I know who you're talking about, but it's all good. <laughs> but it's like, and look, man, I'm not, I'm not trying to like, at the end of the day, I'm not trying to compete with those people. Like I got my guys and if people want to come in and work with me. Like they know where to find me. I'm not trying to enter into knife fights, but I think a big issue is that sensationalism. There's no barrier to entry. There's no context because it's not the medium for it. It's 60 seconds, yes. right? Like it's a 60 second video. And like, even like I got to catch myself and putting stuff out. Like, you know, you got to, you got to have some skin in the game, right? Like if you don't exist on Instagram and you're not like an OG, like you're not yeah. really, this is, this is where the game is played. So like, you know, yeah. I throw my hat into the ring, but I have to be very careful on the words I choose, the captions I write trying to go in and give context to, to the situation so people have, if they so choose, a reference point or something to go back to and be like, okay, if this applies to me, I'm going to use it. Gotcha. And then like, it's just, it's novelty, right? And I think that's mm -hmm. what separates a good, uh, like a good strength coach from just some dude on Instagram doing air bicep curls. It's mm -hmm. like the idea, and I always make a comparison um, and it's not like the most PC thing in the world, but I always say like, imagine if you knew nothing about nutrition. And you were like, you sat down on a bus and, and some like big dude, like, I don't know, like five, 600 pound dude sat next to you. And was like, Hey man, like I'm trying to lose some weight, any advice? And like, and you know nothing about nutrition. Like, <laughs> most people could kind of sum up like, all right, man, like maybe like eat a salad and like walk up, like take the stairs and not the elevator. Basically. It's like, okay. Like thermo day, that's like basic energy in, energy out stuff. And like, you know, may, we don't know nothing about this guy and there's no underlying issue. Maybe it's just, let's, let's start there. Mm -hmm. right that's a novel approach like this is novel this is going to be a new thing for this dude to try mm -hmm. oh yeah sweet thanks man but then the next day that same guy goes on the bus and sits down next to him is this large jamaican dude who runs a 19 19 200 meters like if usain bolt sits next to you and goes hey i run a 19 19 200 meters any advice what salads take the stairs like that's not gonna fucking work man like <laughs> yeah. you have to be very specific Right, like you know, if I think it's Sif and Verkashansky when you read Super Training, there's a line in that book that says, "If your body was a bank, you would never do business there." Mm -hmm. And then he talks about the principle of diminishing returns. So, yeah. like, you know, I'm always trying to make, like, not just like people's, like, not just like the best athletes better, but 
find efficient ways to make your best better. Yeah. Right? And I think being very specific in that approach is going to be the best way to do it because so much of it is just it's just fluff. It's just sensationalism. And hey, you know, like feed your family, pay your bills, do what you got to do. As long as you're not hurting anyone, I don't really care. Mm -hmm. But like at the same time, like there has to be some way and the open market sorts people out long enough. And I think, you know, to a certain degree, you over time, you'll start to see people fall off. Yeah. But like, I think it's just being able to be specific. Like there's no such thing as a dumb exercise or a bad exercise. An exercise without a specific intent is a bad exercise. So, true. so if you can't bring it, bring it down from, you know, the, the meso to the, like the meso psycho to the microbiology, like you don't do the exercise. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's my biggest thing, like overarching, like it's easy to like, Oh, that banded, whatever is dumb or that is, but I think those, all of those stem from this might work for a novel, like a novel effect, like a novel response or adaptation mm -hmm. where you need to be driving specificity, at least when you try and work at like our level specificity is at everything. Yeah, for sure. And I, I remember a post that you put up, I think it was a, maybe a couple of days ago about, um, you know, we got to be very careful when we say it depends. And what does that actually mean? You know, what does that entail? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because that was interesting. So we're getting smarter. Like we're definitely as an industry, we're getting smarter. I think like, you know, people are putting out some great shit and it's awesome to see. And hopefully we can like dilute out a lot of the noise with like people just because the problem is. The, the smart people, the really smart people are so smart to know there's so much to know. And then they get worried about putting stuff out because of that idea of like, look, context. Right. So when pe but now all of a sudden, like, you know, the people who are out there trying to turn a buck, they're starting to use our language. Right. And like, look, it always depends. But the, I find a lot of people these days are when they're almost skirting questions and they're mm -hmm. sounding altruistic by going, well, you know, that well, I mean, that really that depends, you know, and. That's that's like the question. That's the answer. It's like you should I can like if you ask me a question, my goal will be to lay out every variable of that question. Mm -hmm. it de if it, or it depends on, you know, the height of the athlete, it depends on mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the previous injury it depends on this, 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 this. And if we're talking about this variable, this variable breaks down into these three sub variables. These is how we would address it. If we're talking about this other variable, these, this is sort of going to be the context around this variable. So to sit back and be like, oh, well, like, yeah, mm, you'd never, it really, it depends. And, you know, I can only have so much time in my Instagram stories. And it's just, and the upper dorsimus connects to that. It's like, all right, bro, like you have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Like, cause that's the thing. Like there's, there's, there's something to be said about sophistication. Yeah. Right? And it's something that I've, I've learned to really like when you see it you, and the best part about sophisticated concepts or, or programming or things like that is when you see it, you don't even know you're looking at it. And mm -hmm. that's it's, to me, it's so like, Oh, that's my goal. Like when I write programs for guys, I just want to write like, you know, the behind the scenes and I, like, like the drafts and thrown out and like this fucking Sudoku puzzle of programming. And I like the layers and filters that you look at programs through. And at the end of it, I want to present them something that they don't appreciate. I want to present them a program or a spreadsheet where it's like, I'm sitting there going like, oh, and they see exercises, they see reps, they see sets, they see rest periods, they see tempos, and they see a thing on notes and maybe a video cue. And that's the program. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there and I see like, you know, seven, eight layers of depth and complexity, seven different filters I put through this program to make sure that everything resonates. Yeah. And at the end of the day, they just see another program. And it's, that's great because that's the whole point, right? Sure. If I'm, if I got like, yeah, you know, in, you, in column C, you, okay, column C is, that is, there's an equation in column C that's going to, and, and we're going to go over here and that, make sure you put it in call. And it's like, no, man, like that's, that's not, that's, that's complicated. Sophisticated is like, I always make the comparison of the Apple billboard. Mm -hmm. right? Like ever see an Apple billboard. It's just, and, and like, it's just a, it's just a phone on a white backdrop. Yeah. So when I work, so my, when I said I, I work corporate, my first job as a chiropractor was at Apple's world headquarters. So I worked on site when I say corporate wellness, that, oh, that was my job. Damn. Yeah. So I worked in, yeah. So it was like kind of like out of the, out of the, out of the pan into the fire right away. But like, yeah. so this was my job. Like I worked with the, you know, the staff at Apple world headquarters from, you know, CEO directors to, you know, software engineer, hardware engineer. And one of my patients, he was on the team that made those billboards. 
Mm-hmm. And like, so, you know, you, you establish a good relationship with patients the same way you do with athletes. And it's like, over time, like, you know, as I got more comfortable with them, I was like, man, like, what, what an easy job. And like, <laughs> with the most, the dumbest thing I could have said, because he's like, are you fucking serious? I'm like, dude, you put like black phones on white backdrops and you put, I, like, dude, we run through thousands oh, yeah. of iterations of those thousands like oh, yeah. just, so we have somewhere like the light hits the corner of the phone here but we have another see the difference i'm like you guys are out of your mind yeah. so he's like yeah but that's the point yeah. like that's anything worth doing is worth overdoing and ever since then i was like oh like that's such an art like the, the subtle art of sophistication is something that like because on the on the surface like someone could like i could take a photo put it on a white backdrop and put it up and to the uninitiated Look, I'd be like, oh yeah, no iPhone, iPhone billboard template, sure. But mm-hmm. then, like, to like that that artisan, to that craftsman, they look at it and go, oh, I see the moves. I see what you did there with like the shadow, and like mm-hmm. I can see that. I know when I see good programming from other coaches, it's like you start to see like, you know, through the program, like that guy in Patch Adams with the four fingers, and like you're seeing <laughs> the other four fingers come through. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I see what you did there, right? Like, are right, you trying to attenuate for lower back load? So you went for like a counterbalance squat pattern there because you're going to hinge the next day. Like, Smart. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So that's that for me, like when we go back to the root of the question of like, what's the biggest issue? It's like, there's just no specificity. There's no sophistication. It's just all like noise. It's all just novelty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's interesting too, because if you're looking at like with my, with my, even with my video guys, like they look at other videos and I just see like a video. I'm like, oh, that's cool. But he's like pointing out different things. Like, no, this is just how they, they set it up with two mics. and It's just crazy stuff, man, with lighting and all this other stuff. So I get it. And it's the same thing when if I'm looking at programming, it's the same way. But I'm looking at it, and I'm also read, – I read people fairly well. I think I do, you know, at the end of the day. And you can see what, who's true and who's real and who has the goods as far as really putting out that quality content, you know, and then the ones that are just kind of getting likes, you know. And that's why – you, that's why we connected too, because I knew what you were doing with certain posts, and you were just putting out these pictures that were grabbing people. But you were—it was so much context that was developed into that post that it made people understand, at least from that perspective, of what you're trying to relay over. So, I mean, I do wanted to talk to you about this one though. So, the gate is the gatekeeper gatekeeper exercises yeah 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 let's talk a little bit about that because that that's interesting to me because i i, I kind of I, I feel like i do similar things but i want to get your take on that one yeah so like gatekeeper exercises are just kind of like a principle that I, I abide by and i think a lot of people do i just kind of slapped a name to it so it makes it easier to teach when i go over that like you know with some of the courses so the gatekeeper exercise is basically like first and foremost we need to look at the difference between strength and stability Right. So I really try and clearly define mobility, stability and strength and kind of their roles and in interplay, how they interplay with one another. Like, you know, how mobility is the prerequisite to getting into unstable position. And then you having a perception of stability around a joint is our is our um, prerequisite to actually being able to display or express strength. Mm-hmm. Right. So when we look at something like before I load, I want to maximize my perception of stability. And, I, and I'm very careful in the words that I choose when I say perception. Mm-hmm. Is it's just that. So, like, I could, you know, I could, like, strap my pelvis to a, a leg extension, and that would increase the perception of stability. But that is external. It's outside of my own body. Mm-hmm. Or I could use the muscles of my adductors, maybe, like, the muscles of my core, my diaphragm to pelvic floor, and maybe even the muscles of my lateral hip to in, get that same perception of stability, but rather internally. So prior to load, my biggest thing is, look, if I'm preparing for exercise and I'm going to implement some sort of, you know, movement strategy for the exercise that's to come, I'm going to make sure that I, that perception of stability around the joints we're going to load is as great as, as, great as possible. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not a huge like mobility guy. Like mm-hmm. I think it has its place in early stages of training with a, with like a newer client who hasn't necessarily been trained in this, in this way or in this, in this thought process. I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say like system, but mm-hmm. like this systems way of thinking. So like what I think for a gatekeeper exercise is I want, I want to basically improve that perception of stability. So I need to get them into unstable positions. So these exercises are more or less stability drills and stability drills itself, I think is worthy of 
like clear definition. Mm-hmm. Stability is a progression of stability would be either a minimizing of a base of support mm-hmm. or a deviation of center of mass or combined center of mass. So like an example I like to use for the shoulder when talking about like gatekeeper exercises is let's say I'm going to bench press, right? So any sort of horizontal, regardless of the variation, just horizontal press. Mm-hmm. That's my first exercise. I'm going to come into the gym and I want to stabilize my scapula mm-hmm. and I want to stabilize my rotator cuff, right? Okay. So I want to stabilize the ball in the socket and the socket on the rib cage. Those are my two major points of stability that I want to make sure are dialed in. Those perceptions are there mm-hmm. before I go loading, you know, hundreds of pounds over my face mm-hmm. or whatever the exercise is. So I take an exercise, I look at the scapula first, and it's like, all right, let's start central and then work out. Then something like a kettlebell windmill. So like, Mm -hmm. uh, what I like about a windmill is these gatekeeper exercises, and the windmill is one of them, is it has a mobility prerequisite hardwired into it, right? So if I'm doing a windmill, I need extension and rotation of my thoracic spine. So rather than sitting down on like a roller and doing some thread the needle stuff right away, I'm like, hey, grab kettlebell, get in the overhead position, we're going to flex and externally rotate that shoulder. We're going to hinge and we're going to start to actively extend and rotate, trying to keep like a straight line through from index finger to index finger. That's like, that's how I want to, and if they can execute it and they don't over rotate the humerus and they can kind of get right between the legs with the opposite hand, I know that that thoracic spine is cleared. Mm-hmm. I know we have enough extension and rotation on that thoracic spine and mm-hmm. enough stability in that scapula in these unstable ranges mm-hmm. that we can start to worry about loading strength on top of this solid base. Mm-hmm. If not, it's like, okay, we don't have the rotation right now. Let's fall back. Maybe we do some T-spine rotation drill. So mm-hmm. it's almost like I, I think of it like a, like, a, like a quarterback traversing a field on a drive. So we walk in, we're, pre- we're, like, we're loading horizontally. That's going to be – that's the end zone. Right. So we're, we fall back in the pocket. First play scapula. We start to look around. You know, we, do we have the option to go into the next play? Can we get that first down and clear the T-spot? Can we effectively get the windmill done uh, adequately and sufficient to sufficient like movement quality standards? Mm-hmm. If yes, we make that throw. We get that first down. We move to the next play. Okay. If no, we pass short and we fall back and go into T-spine rotation. Okay. Right, we fall back now. Okay, all right. Now we're gonna we can't clear the T spine. This isn't going into the next play. We're not gonna move to the rotator cuff. We fall back. We worry about the T spine extension rotation. All right, next play. Now we're at the rotator cuff. Where so we're scapula is sufficiently stabilized on the rib cage. Now we need the humerus to be sufficiently stabilized in the scapula. Mm-hmm. So next play, we have the two options. We're gonna pass it short, or we're gonna go to the end zone, and that end zone is going to be begin to load. So this is mm-hmm. gonna be your first set of bench press. So we fall back. You know, I like the bottoms under press with a kettlebell, right? Because if mm-hmm. this is now going to clear my rotational balances at the shoulder, if I press up and I'm biasing internal rotation, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be able to perform that bottom under press. The bottom under press lives where I can keep flexion and external rotation, right? mm-hmm. so I can press up and kind of rotate. keep that wrist stacked on exactly rotate rotator cuff. This mm-hmm. is what I'm trying to train from a stability standpoint. Mm-hmm. So we we fall back. We're we're like looking at this play of the bottoms under press. Are, are we completing it successfully? Let's say yes. All right, we go downfield. I go bottom under press. I don't need to stretch the last. I don't need to stretch the pack. I don't need a foam roll shit. I have the adequate range of motion to go through that. Now I'm going right onto a barbell. Nice. I go right into an a- empty bar bench and I go through it again. Mm-hmm. I go through that windmill. I go through that bottom under press back on the bar. Maybe my first warm up set's 135. Mm-hmm. I go through it again. And then I go through my second warm-up set, maybe it's 185. And I go through it again, and then maybe it's 225. And now, because we look at the warm-up in, as a segmented part. Like, it's a segmented part of our workout where it needs to be, it needs to be integrated. Like, I always make the comparison of, like, like a 4 by 100 relay. This is the baton, right? Mm-hmm. This, is, this needs to be passed from warm-up to workout. So when, or, yeah, from warm-up to workout. So when, like, the second runner is receiving the baton, he's already moving. Uh-huh. Right, he's not just sitting there on the gram and then homie, hundred percent, yeah, him on the shoulder and it's like, Bro. no, take the stick, dog, go. <laughs> so that's the thing. It's like, okay, here we have warm up that starts. We come in, you know, we do, we we do a windmill. Oh shit! All right, we go back. We work on T spine rotation. Come back to windmill. Go to bottom under press. Mm-hmm. We good? Not good? Say so we're not good. All right, stretch the lat, stretch the pecs. Things that are going to internally rotate our shoulders. All right, we, we good. Bottoms under press. Sweet. We go on the bar. And now it's like we're kind of building this momentum. The, gotcha. war- the warm-up stuff falls off. The workout continues. And now, now we're hitting paces. Now we're, now we're off. So 
So that's how I like to look at it. Not like, you know, we're going to go on the, the treadmill for five minutes to get the blood moving. It's like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. false. I'm still alive. No, don't worry. The blood's moving. Like, go on the treadmill for five minutes if the workout that follows it is the treadmill for 20 minutes. Gotcha. Uh, specificity. Yeah. Yeah, specificity. Right? I don't what the fuck I need treadmill for when I'm going to be laying on my back with a barbell over my face. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sense. yeah, that's So crazy. that's like my that idea. My idea of gate keeper principle is like, you shall not pass. Like, if I can't hold a 35 pound kettlebell and go through a couple bottoms under press, mm-hmm. I'm not unracking 400 pounds over my face. If mm-hmm. I have a rotator cuff that in isolation cannot prove to me it can resist force or get in range of motion where it can resist force to improve that perception, I am not going to have the same quality movement under that bar if I otherwise would be able to. So sometimes it takes five minutes, sometimes it takes 20 minutes mm-hmm. of going like, Go through empty bar. Oh, that didn't feel good. Go through 10 pounds a side. Go through again quarters a side. Go through again 135. So yeah. for me, it's like, you shall not pass. Like, that's kind of, I always have a big Gandalf guy up on my slide because it's like, that is the gatekeeper. Yeah. Until you go can get in the range of motion to perform these drills and show proficiency and, mm-hmm. and skill and resisting force at these end ranges, you're yeah. not loading. You, you, don't, you, haven't, you haven't earned the ability to express strength and skill yet. Yeah, exactly. So you would want to see optimal mobility, stability in ranges before you go and do the lift, but you don't want to stop the training session altogether. We got to keep things flowing. And that's one thing that's super important, especially if you're in a time crunch too, as well, especially with like multiple athletes at one time, you know, so that makes sense. Now, this this falls into your integration and isolation principles, right? In, In a way. Yeah, and I mean, I think the biggest thing is like, you know, we we can't out corrective exercise bad exercise, right? Mm-hmm. So like, we can have all these gatekeeper things, and we can do all this stuff right, but if we come out of the gate with this an ineffective program and bad technique and pro- improper load management, it's like your likelihood for injury is still going to be relatively high, right? Mm-hmm. So I think the big thing to understand, like when we integrate, is what happens when things go wrong. Like I think so many so many uh, so many coaches get stuck in their program from like a reps and sets and exercise they don't understand it from an intent standpoint Mm -hmm. like you know especially in a group setting like if you know i can imagine like working att and you got a group of just like killers or like i got a i got a weight room full of college athletes Mm -hmm. and i'm starting to see some people just aren't it's just not happening for them today and the first exercise we have is like uh, i don't know like a hang clean or a power snatch or something Mm -hmm. like that and it's like, okay, well, what's the intent of that exercise? Is yeah. it to make them better Olympic weightlifters or is it to improve power? Like, well, it's to improve power. And so it's like, if I see, you know, people that are just, you know, they're going through their rounds of gatekeeper, they're just not getting there. Mm-hmm. All right, look, we got an hour before bigs come in. We got an hour before skills come in. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to pull the option on like the hang clean or the power snatch or whatever it is. And we're going to box jump. Yes. Because the intent is the same. Same. The intent is still explosive power. Like that's mm-hmm. really get up on that box as fast as you fucking can. Yeah. Like, or maybe it's it's something where like, hey, we're gonna attack, we're gonna do some ground contact time stuff, and that's really gonna be what we do today. Mm-hmm. And next week we come at it, and we'll we'll get to the power snap or the the hang clean next week. But yeah. that's like I think you need to be able to look at your exercises from an intent standpoint. So when, as we integrate this in, it's you know, it matters how we integrate it. Like, you know, we get it right on the front end, Mm -hmm. but if you try and jam this not happening shaped peg into a, you know, a power clean shaped hole, it's like, that's not a good program. Right. So it's like, okay, you know, give, take what you're given on the day, which I think it's hard for coaches because like, I mean, I know guys that write a whole year's worth of program and it's, and that's great. You know, it's like that Tyson quote, right? Everyone's got a plan to so get punched in the face, right? And it's like every day as a strength coach is just getting punched in the face. <laughs> like I check my phone and I got videos from my guys and it's just like, you know, one of my dudes, we had a program written for next week. He texted me this morning. You know, he's he, he works with the Giants and he's out stuck in California. We're trying to get him some equipment. And I was like, great. You know, he's going to. He's got some kettlebells and some shit right now. We got him like hooked up with like a rig and a rack and bars and benches oh, nice. and stuff. Yeah. So it's like programs, programs written mm-hmm. for the bars and the benches to arrive. Bars and benches didn't arrive. So uh, it's like once I get off this call, I gotta go rewrite another program for another yeah. week with like you know the, the ninety pound kettlebell he has. And it's like how do you how do you play in the NFL and this is the only shit you have in your home gym? Well, <laughs> I, I didn't expect the apocalypse, bro. I was like. 
<laughs> that's I think the biggest thing is like my one of my favorite quotes. It's actually from you know John Stewart, like the yeah. guy who did, used to do the Daily Show. Yeah, I, I'm huge. Like you know, obviously I was into politics and political science and all that. Mm. And he has this quote, and I don't even remember how old it is and how old I was when I heard it. But it's have clarity of vision and flexibility of process. Mm. I think that's people's best asset as a coach is like, look, know where you need to go, but know the like the you need to have that flexibility and that fluidity to be able to adapt on the fly, especially when it comes to like the programming side of things. Yeah, that, that that comes with experience too, in my opinion. I think that like with a lot of these kids, like these interns will come in or these new coaches will come in from different schools and like you're like, oh, well, that's not what you had on the paper. I was like, yo, fuck what they had on the paper, all right? This is what we're doing right now. <laughs> like, there's a lot of shit that we got to change right now just based off of what I'm seeing from, again, those, you know, those basically gatekeeper exercises that I'll use where I'll use basic movement patterns to regulate what's going on. And if I feel that they're not ready for it, then we have to change it up. We have to call the audible, you know. So that makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna start using that though. I definitely and I must listen, guys. I actually am gonna start take. I'm gonna take. Uh, I'm taking Jordan's uh, course. So make sure you guys check that out. By the way, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a shameless plug on that one. I definitely want to take it. You know, again, I'm always trying to learn, and I gotta learn from guys that I truly respect. So, dope. But. All right, so give me. I'm giving you another question because I'm, I'm kind of, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna be a little selfish today. Everybody, everybody asks me questions. I'm gonna ask questions. You know what I mean? I got the podcast, so I kind of do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so, all right. So, what are you looking for when an athlete comes to see you? Right? When you come in, they come in. You're you're setting up a consultation. What is the first go to? Are you put getting them on the floor? Are you sitting them down? What's going on there? Uh, first thing, man, history. I think so many coaches skate over that, especially when you start working on the one-on-one. -on -one. Like, it can be hard to get, like, a detailed history on, you know, you got 50 guys. And you, yeah, shit. Off-season, like, you're, you're in the NFL. You got, your, you got your, your player, like, your practice squad guys. That's – you're looking at 60 guys. Like, mm -hmm. how the fuck – you're not taking – but, it, like, you know, when you work more, like, concierge one-on-one, -on -one, the first thing is going to be detailed history. Like, mm -hmm. give me lifestyle. Give me, give me perceived stress levels. Give me – Past injuries is a big one for me. Like that helps like curate a lot of my program design is around past injuries, um, and that's going to be like you know an extensive questionnaire, um, and it definitely takes more of like a clinical background in the way I look at it. But it's here's the thing: like clinical theory is accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. It's just the critical thinking and practical application that a lot of people miss. Like yeah. I'm taking an injury history, but I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. So like I, I'm not going to be changing the structure like oh I blew my ACL like okay all right so I'm gonna I, I need to keep that in mind like all right watch deep knee flexion lateral hip stability ankle mobility you know we're gonna train the shit out of the hamstrings in a less specific training phase but these are things that are auto populating in my head as people are kind of talking to me so mm -hmm. uh, taking a detailed history is number one then when it comes to like the actual manual stuff and like the the the, the, the physical side of things it's for me I center. I center my approach around the shoulder, hip, and the spine. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking to assess basically variability, capacity, and power always. Right. So when I get someone comes in, you know, that initial assessment is going to be an assessment around variability. So I look at the joints of the shoulder, hip, and spine first. Like I kind of have this model where I think of the body as three hubs of stability. Mm -hmm. right? We have these peripheral hub in the shoulder and hip, a central hub at the spine. Now, each one of these hubs got to play by a different rule book, right? So like what happens at the hip? There's going to be a different function. There's going to be different actions at the muscles or rather the shoulder. It's going to be different than the hip. I think a lot of people go like, okay, here's my algorithm for the body. It's like, no, no, it can't. I have a different algorithm for parts of the spine. If we just say spine is like, yeah, what upper cervical, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, ribs, pelvis. Like what, what exactly are we talking about? Because each one of these regions is going to have a different rule book. So I look at basically I look at function and it's like, fuck, what a useless word that has become. But for me, like I give like, even like my athletes and even if they don't care, I'll tell them like my definition of function is how the body behaves when we walk and breathe. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is like namaste in the garden all day. This is like this is deep anatomy, biomechanics, physiology shit. Right. Like if we look at like diaphragmatic excursion, if we start to look at, you know, uh, ventilation, respiration rates, your left lung versus right lung, how that will affect, you know, thoracic spine mechanics, how the thoracic spine and scapula and glenohumeral joint actually behave when we walk, 
right? Mm-hmm. That upward downward rotation, the internal to external rotation on flexion extension respectively, how that even transfers out to the wrist and, and pronation as an expression of internal rotation. Mm-hmm. Then we go to the shoulder, gait cycle mechanic. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I spent a lot of time with like, you know, you read a lot of strength coaches, Charlie Francis, like old sprint coaches, Derek Hansen on the West Coast in Canada, like mm-hmm. go deep into what the body's meant to do when it takes that gait cycle mm-hmm. to end ranges, right? Yeah. So for the shoulder, basically, it's like, okay, how well can we flex and externally rotate the shoulder? For the hip, how well can we extend and internally rotate that hip? And then for the mm-hmm. spine, how well can we resist force? All three planes, right? So that's kind of how I look, how I structure it. So if someone comes in with like shoulder issue, I'm going to rip through a few assessments, like from a variability standpoint, which is mm-hmm. basically how well can you actively move this thing into flexion, external rotation? Mm-hmm. Are we going to be looking to improve strength if you don't have the variability, if you don't have that range of motion? Or do you have enough variability that we can start to train stability as a separate adaptation? Mm-hmm. Right. So if someone comes in, they got full range. Great. Load them with something unstable. Let's see what the capacity is. Give them a kettlebell. Have them go for a walk. And all of a sudden, whoa, whoa, it's like, whoa, whoa, what happened there? Like this is, regardless of structural damage, this is an opportunity to improve function, right? If we can improve function, like I'm just trying to improve the way your shoulder responds and strategizes around flexion and external rotation. That's mm-hmm. going to be where the serratus lives. That's going to be where the teres minor lives. So, and at the hip, how well can we extend and internally rotate? How does gait cycle mechanics start to then tie in with breathing, mm-hmm. right? Like just like the the diaphragm is going to affect our shoulders, like if we think of the scapulothoracic joint as a lot of people look at the scapulothoracic joint, but they really only look at one side of it, right? Mm-hmm. The scapulothoracic joint is the joint between the rib cage and the shoulder blade, mm-hmm. right? But when people look at it, like, oh, I'm going to like fix my posture and all this, like, yeah, okay. But when they look at the scapula, they just look at the joint from one side. You know, they mm-hmm. do face pulls and they retract the shoulder blades, or they do like scap sets and they depress the shoulder blade. Dude, what about the rib cage, man? Like this is half the battle right here. And what's going to control the rib cage is our ability to control our breathing, yeah. right? This expansion, this posterior expansion of the rib cage is going to allow us to get such more stable scapulas, like learning how to breathe into that upper back properly and symmetrically on both sides. So just as that will affect, the breathing will affect that peripheral hub of the shoulder. As we go down into the pelvis, now breathing is going to have a huge effect. There's a fascial attachment between the diaphragm and the psoas. Mm-hmm. So breathing is going to have a huge effect on like that. Pre- oh, I got a tight hip flexor. So if you have a tight hip flexor, do you have an unstable lumbar spine and you don't know how to breathe properly? Because mm-hmm. every time you go to exert force, you mm-hmm. you hold and you brace, and then you go through a concentric phase, and then like, you're inhaling on an eccentric. It's like, dude, like that's why I say like it's not this crunchy granola. No, just walk and breathe shit. It's like <laughs> this is the, these are the fundamental elements of human evolution. Yeah. We're different, and the like we hunt lions. We have no business. Like the same person who's wearing like, you know, bubble wrap around their face and buying up all the toilet paper right now is, is born of the same person that walks through the Serengeti and goes, yo, that lion in two days is going to be my bitch. Yeah. It's like, what? Dude, are you serious? There's no fucking way. And <laughs> off we go. Walk. Because we can dissociate walk like a breath cycle and gait cycle. Mm-hmm. A lion, when it's running, every time that front foot hits, that front what an insert animal, horse, gallop, hoof, whatever hits, mm-hmm. they're horizontally oriented or orientated. So like that, their diaphragm gets pushed into by its guts and it has to exhale every single time it runs. Mm-hmm. So Usain Bolt runs, what well, Usain Bolt runs 100 meters in 41 strides. He does yeah. it on four breaths. <laughs> Tell yeah. me a lion has a chance in hell against that. That's fucked. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's 100% true, man. Like. I think um, I think a lot of people just misinterpret things and, and don't understand like the true basics of biomechanics in a way, you know, and you just got to take it back. Like you said, just just break it down a little bit more, you know, and, and have more knowledge on that subject before you go ahead and load a particular movement pattern, you know, so I like what you're doing. Well, I just think like too many people don't know, you know, what biomechanics is. Yeah, they just think yeah. it's they just think it's physics. <laughs> you know, I, I've had, dude, I know the interns you're talking about, right? Like they come in, they got, the, we talked, they got pocket protector, they got like, you know, their school polo on, <laughs> a little collar, and, you know, maybe they, maybe they got it tight, right? Maybe the, bi- maybe they got a bicep vein. They got a little bit of bicep. The fucking, <laughs> fucking medium sized shirt. And they got the khakis. Khakis. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's like, it's, they're like Under Armour though. They're like low key, like, you know, because I'm an athlete, because I'm a strength coach, because these are like the Under Armour. They look, look how stretchy these pants are, dog. Look, look how, it's like, 
And they got like the New Balance on or like Nike Free or some Netcons. And it's like, oh, for <laughs> fuck's sake. Are you serious with this kid right now? And he comes in and he starts drawing straight lines. And he starts like, well, you know, if we divide by pi at the ankle. And I'm just like, hey, hey, put that shit away. Put your calculator away and open your fucking eyes. Do you see three dimensions on that guy or do you see two? Yeah. I see, I see, I see three dimensions, and I see a guy with a wife and two kids, yeah. and he's up for he's up for free agency at the end of the year. Put your goddamn protractor away and pay attention. <laughs> like it's not biomechanics. Yeah. You look, you're studying physics, bio, person, that yeah. that thing over there, that guy with a name and like mm -hmm. a like a a forty time. That's what we're worried about. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's it's frustrating, dude, because like I was taught that I, I had some old dude teach me biomechanics they go, yeah it's biomechanics i'm like what this is the same thing like if a tr if a train leaves chicago going 43 miles an hour detroit is you know 270 miles away what time does the train land in or the train arrive in detroit it's like mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not how the body works man like it's not straight lines it's it's anticipating past and least resistance it's ah, fuck I swear, uh, just, I can't, man. I get so frustrated. Hey, he's, he's definitely frustrated. If you guys didn't see the video, he threw his marker at the, at the camera. <laughs> so he's definitely frustrated in this. But, so, all right, with that being said, like, you obviously know the body. You know how it moves, you know, um, and you know the backdrop of it. So when you're looking at it from, like, a broad spectrum, and I know this is super general, and there's, I could give you more context on it, but... From a basic standpoint, like what do you see as far as common dysfunctions with athletes that you work with? What are the common themes that we're seeing? I mean, start from the ground up. It, for me, it's feet. Like feet mm -hmm. first, and like not feet first, mm -hmm. but feet first in like a chronological order, starting from the feet up. Like I'm not like mm -hmm. a weird foot guy or anything. Like none of my guys are doing like towels, scrunches. Like look, you know, when, <laughs> hey, when we're doing when we're doing a goblet squats, kick, kick the shoes. Right, like when we're doing when we're doing seated calf raises, you want to build intrinsic foot musculature. See how much see how much you got with a seated calf raise. Yeah. Right, like let's like well, I'm not I don't care if you have like bovine sized calves. I'm just like this mm -hmm. is how we do ankle mobility in the program because mm -hmm. you're an athlete. We're just going to eccentrically load into flexion. Mm -hmm. I think a big thing depending on sport that people miss because like ankles and feet are like they kind of because it's obscure, right? Like no one was talking about it for a while, but mm -hmm. now it's like people kind of like oh we, I can talk about this and say some really low hanging fruit stuff, but people don't know about it. So I'm going to sound real smart. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that people miss a lot, depending on the sport is like, you know, I, mixed martial arts is probably one, mixed martial arts, tennis, and depending on your position in football, the role at the ankle to invert and evert effectively, mm -hmm. right? Like I see so many groin sprains that start at the ankle Yeah, because the guy goes to cut, he's running a route. He runs, you know, he goes to, he goes to juke to ditch a guy. And all of a sudden there goes the groin. It's like, because it started at the foot. We just look at, oh, how's his plantar flexion? How's his dorsiflexion? It's like, yeah. you know, if you're a sagittal sport athlete, like, yeah, look at that. But if you need to start cutting, these ankles need to be able to invert and evert. Because if we sure. lose the ability to invert here, tennis players, medial gastroc tears, that starts from the foot. They're, yeah. they're constantly in this lateral motion. Uh, when we move up to the knee, you know, that's going to be much more like signaling from the hip and ankle. Like, I don't do much directly at the knee. I think a misunderstanding of like the, one of the common dysfunction patterns is not understanding how we use the lateral rotators and gait cycle. People mm -hmm. are constantly training, you know, that strength or like they'll train like articulations and movements and stuff with like their foot in the air. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, the it's that glute is going to work when it, the foot is on the ground. It's lateral stability of the pelvis and stance phase of gait. Like this is going to be a big thing that we worry about. So I know plenty of people who like, We'll try and strain strength of the lateral hip, yeah. which is like, look, it has its place, absolutely. But it's like, if you're not training stability of the lateral hip, the ability to resist force rather than exert force, mm -hmm. like, don't just stand on, like, don't just go like monster walk it all the way through. Like, there's a place for that, but mm -hmm. you got to make sure on the front end of that that we have an ability to, like, basically, can you do a single leg RDL? Yeah. Can you can you do a hip airplane? Can you can you start to introduce like unilateral loads to these single single leg mm -hmm. movements? Mm -hmm. um, upwards at the spine. I'm not big on dynamic movement through the lumbar spine. Again, mm -hmm. resist, resist force through all three planes. One of the biggest dysfunction patterns I think is most people don't progress the way they stabilize the low back, mm -hmm. right? Those, they stick with, they stick with like your, your bird dog, your curl up, like your McGill big three. And it's like, okay, that has to scale, right? Mm -hmm. I want that bird dog is going to be a, some sort of unilateral row variation mm -hmm. that 
that side plank is going to be a Copenhagen plank or a farmer's carry, unilateral farmer's carry. That that curl up better be like a reverse GHR sit up or an ab wheel, right? Mm-hmm. So at the spine, it's not, and at the shoulders, it's just not respecting that upward rotation of the scap. Serratus, mm-hmm. like serratus weakness and instability is probably the thing I see the most. Everyone's like shoulders back, shoulders back, shoulders back. Yeah. You're putting your serratus to sleep when you <laughs> squeeze your rhomboids together. Right? Yeah. So like head to toe, quick overlap. I mean, again, context, right? We could go all day. Those are like the high points I see from head to toe is, is, is that. Yeah, and it's funny because like with, with the serratus, that's, that's another key muscle that we utilize when you're talking about, you know, producing force with a punch or a strike. So like I do see that a lot where these guys are, are predominantly kyphotic in nature just because of the, the amount of volume that they're doing in the anterior chain. So like I still need to work the serratus though, but we also have to gain some quality shoulder flexion in order for us to do some type of loading. So I'm, I'm kind of battling that, that as we speak, but... Um, when it comes down to, when it comes down to like looking at an athlete, what would be the most important part which you would see? I know you said that, yeah, we want to develop mobility, stability, and then go ahead and work our way into the exercise. Um, but like I said, if you're working up the kinetic chain and you're seeing this dysfunction, are we loading anything? Are we working around it? Or are we just going to be like, all right, let's stop them there and not scale it until they're ready to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. And I mean, no, like the dog's got to hunt, right? Yeah. Like, because look, they're just going to go somewhere else. Like, I know how athletes are because mm-hmm. I am one. Like, if someone <laughs> if someone tries to keep me on the chain, it's like, oh, easy. I'm just going to go to a gym where, like, someone's not going to make me do a bunch of rehab geriatric shit, <laughs> right? So I think the biggest thing, like, so let's maybe let's talk about the shoulder mm-hmm. where I, I think the, the overarching principle for a strength coach is to make exercises subjectively difficult without being objectively heavy. That's it. Cause it's like, you need, you have to scratch that itch, man. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like you're dealing, especially with your, fuck. I like, I think about your day at work and it stresses me out. <laughs> Cause like you literally have like killers that you work with. And like I, I, fighters are the nicest people in the world. They're the yeah. nicest people you'd ever want to know. Like when I, when we start thinking about athletes that I've worked with, and my favorite are always the fighters, but it's like keeping that on the rails. It's like, it takes a bit of finessing as far as exercise selection. So Mm -hmm. like, I'm not confident in going overhead with someone, but they need to have something at a high angle press. So if I know they don't have that stability at that, you know, they're approaching their end range, I'm Mm -hmm. gonna put them in a a scenario where when they're loading in that end end range, they're as stable as possible, right? So I'm not gonna go, you know, dumbbell overhead press, Maybe I, maybe I go seated on like a machine and that's how we, we press, right? And hey, mm-hmm. open it up. You're safe now. You're, you're at the end ranges of what we'll call your active range. So your stability is going to be like a little bit, mm, mm-hmm. but we're on a machine mm-hmm. that knock it out. So right? yeah. don't have a machine, load up the landmine, right? Yes. Like, you know, don't, don't always all. So here's like maybe another sound bite is always, you always want to regress the pattern rather than reduce the load, right? Okay. Like, someone would rather do a heavy landmine press than a light overhead press, right? Because okay. it's like, oh, you don't really have that. You can't go super heavy because, like, you don't have the best range of motion. So it's like, okay, put them in a scenario where for the exercise they can go super heavy. But, mm-hmm. like, you know what? A heavy landmine press compared to, like, a heavy over press, overhead press, mm-hmm. it's going to be – it's going to be way more of like a positive return on that risk benefit ratio yeah. to be here loading within that active range in a more mm. stable environment than having this infinitely unstable bar in an infinitely unstable position. Yeah. It's like I always say, like people ask me, why don't you ever do like Olympic lifts and this? And I'm like, man, listen, they got to have the joint prerequisites to do that shit anyways. And at the end of the day, I got to make sure that I'm getting the stimulus needed. That's all it is, really. Get the stimulus. But <laughs> go, go ahead. I, with the Olympic lifts, like what is, you know why? You know Always. why I don't? Because they're not Olympic lifters. That's like, it. This is a pocket protector dude with like yeah. the, the, the he's got look he's got three pairs of these Under Armour pants, right? He's yeah. got the gray, the brown, and the black. Like I've seen this. You go to conferences and it's like oh, wearing man. a visor inside. Why are you wearing a visor inside? Why are you wearing, why do you own a visor? Stop wearing a fucking visor. Who owns, who owns visors nowadays, man? Those fucking guys, bro. <laughs> hey, look, he's going to come at you with this. Like, he's going to come at you when it comes to, like, you know, when he starts talking about, like, 
these progressions and we start to load in these positions, mm-hmm. he's, he's going to do the same thing every single time. And you're just like, man, like have some like variability. Like when we're talking about like loading these end ranges end ranges of motion, like mm-hmm. you just have to have like some critical thinking and what it is you're de- like, who it is you're dealing with. Yeah. Like, it's just, it just drives me nuts. It's these, ah, like, why? <laughs> like, I hear you. Oh, it so, just stresses me out. How, how many, how many questions do you answer a day on your DMS and stuff? Huh. Uh, as many as I can, man. I love yeah. it. Like, and it's like, I don't know. I, when it's in my wheelhouse, I'll answer them. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's going to be my biggest thing is like, I, you have to like, I, I, I do. I, mean, I think I got to wherever it is I am by doing a certain thing. Like I, I'd answer mm-hmm. When someone asked me my first question on Instagram, like, Are you serious? Like, yeah. This is sick. Yeah. yeah. So as many as I can, and it, it gets hard, man. Like, yeah. uh, I don't know. It, it, once it says 99 plus message requests, you're like, Wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay, tough. I'm gonna need a really long flight to kind of get this, yeah, to get tough. this done. But mm-hmm. yeah, like I don't know. Like I just I like to engage with people. Like I'll send them voice messages and stuff. Just I mean, it's easier on my thumbs, and it's also like, oh, like that's, he's messaging me directly. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm pretty sure people freak out for that, man. You know. Yeah, I just I don't understand. I like to the point. Oh, like that's why I was getting so mad about the Olympic lift. I think the biggest thing that people get, and it's actually kind of ties in because it's a question I get a lot. I think people get tied up in symmetry. People don't mm-hmm. understand sports. Sports are not symmetrical, yeah. right? Like that guy with the three sets of Under Armour pants is going to come in and be like, oh, we need to fix his kyphosis. It's like, no, we don't. No, we don't. <laughs> like my buddy, my, my buddy, Sammy Vargas. Sammy, yeah. Sammy's a, he's a welterweight. He's a welterweight champ out of Toronto. And uh-huh. he walks into Whole Foods like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like... <laughs> You scare the shit out of everyone at Whole Foods. Like, why is he walking in just like talking chin? And I was like, because he's the shape of his sport, yeah. right? Like, I don't want Sammy to come in, you know, go, like yeah. like floating on cloud. Like, hey, what's up? Like, that's that's not the shape. So if someone's going, oh, we need to go, oh, like we really need to improve that thoracic extension. We got to get mm-hmm. those scaps down and back. Why? So he can get blasted in the chin. Why yeah. do we need to do that? Yeah. We need a minimum effective dose of yeah. that so we can start to load to improve power. We always got to fly it close to the sun. Most mm-hmm. people are like, oh, no, like we got to play it safe. I think strength coaches on the whole, the record they're worried about is man games lost. Mm-hmm. Right? So man games lost is like, you know, if you have, you know, the, so I was working with a few years ago, the Niners had, I forget how many, the year before they they, they made the run, so like two years ago, uh-huh. They had some of the, the the biggest man games lost in the league, the most man games lost in the league. And uh-huh. two of their guys, I think it was Street and shit, one more. I did the math on it when I was when I was like in there with them, and it was something like they lost forty million dollars or something on the bench that year. Oh, so shit. like, strength strength coaches worry about that number. It's yeah. like, especially at that level, especially at that level. What you need to worry about, man, what'll sort itself out is if you if your team is going like. Uh, what like I don't know. Uh, what's a maybe we go like two and fifty. Like if you, you make win two games across the seventeen games, right? That's your that's on you, right? Mm-hmm. You can't go out and run the touchdowns. But if you can worry more about performance in the gym mm-hmm. than be worried about necessarily injury, like have all your have all your systems in place so that the mm-hmm. the injury stuff catches itself. But if you can worry about performance, that's what strength coaches should worry about. They should worry about performance of the team, and that is expressed in wins and losses. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily in, you know, man games, lost due to injury. People are just trying to cover their ass. Like, they yeah. just want to keep their job. And, like, it's nice to work on, like, a freelance level. Yeah. It's like, you know, I got a guy from yeah the Giants, a guy from the Panthers, a guy from here, a guy from there. So, it's like, I don't need to sit down with a GM and mm-hmm. be like, oh, yeah, no. So, I could just work directly with the player. His mm-hmm. performance off the field it improves in the offseason, on the field, in the season improves. We're sweet. We can just have this relationship, but at the same time, like if you have a team, because I've had a team before, you need to start to concern yourself with the record of the team, not just not just the man games lost. Don't ever lose that, yeah. but make it performance based. You're a performance mm-hmm. coach. You're not like an injury coach. Yeah. Do you like the Do you like the saying "keep it simple, uh, keep it simple, stupid"? Do you like that saying? I don't really like that saying, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't see it being necessary because at the end of the, I feel like you're you're dumbing down what's supposed to be very intricate and detailed out to the point for the for the coach. This is the same thing we were talking about with Apple. It's like you may think it's simple and that's what we want it to be. But for us, it's intricate, detailed out, and we're making sure that everything is aligned perfectly before we give it to you to where you think it's just a simple process. 
Yeah, I think that's a cop out, bro. Yeah. That's a cop out for like that's the same guy who's rocking up in the visor. Keep it simple. <laughs> that's that's a visor strength coach. But it's like I like uh, like uh, Neil. I'm gonna talk about this, but like Neil deGrasse Tyson has a quote that says like basically the universe is of no obligation to make sense to you. And my mm -hmm. thing is like when I'm explaining stuff to people, it's like look, the human body is of no obligation to make sense to you. Mm -hmm. Like you know, I talk about like. You know, I'm not a big fan of like distracting the shoulder and it's like, wait, but like, it feels like it's doing this. So I just do that. It's like, look, I, I can't, I don't have time for the shit. It, just, it doesn't have to make sense to you. Just let, I'm going to, and you do your, and I'm going to go. Okay. Cause I think that's something people think it's, they, it's a, it has to make sense to them. So it's simplicity is like, look, are you serious? Like, this is complicated. Like mm -hmm. you're not going to go like, you know, fix a car and just like go in there with a wrench and not know what you're doing. It's like, oh, just keep it simple. It's like, all right, you're going to fucking blow your shit up. But yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Got some duct tape and you're good to go. <laughs> Man, so, all right. I mean, honestly, I, I think you are probably one of the other ones, you know, with myself, we kind of on the same wavelength with, with things, but um, you're doing a lot of traveling and you're stuck in Australia right now, but you were doing a lot of traveling before you're doing a lot of seminars. How did you get started doing that and like, you know, transitioning to traveling around the world? Yeah, uh, it was it was through powerlifting actually. So as I, you know, my my powerlifting, we'll call it career for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. just got like accelerated really quickly because my training partners were the best lifters in the world. Mm -hmm. So like my third, my second meet was. My second meet was Reebok Record Breakers, and my third meet was uh, the Arnold Classic in Australia. Mm -hmm. So my, when I when I got invited out to my third meet, you know Australia was a long haul, like I wasn't making a lot of cash, and the guy was like, "Look, we want you to come compete." Um, so they gave me the invite, and but they're like, "You know, we will host you if you want to do some seminars to help pay for it." And at that oh. point, like I was like maybe a year into practice, I hadn't really done anything. I was doing some like Instagram video stuff and trying to do some whiteboard explanation shit. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really thrown anything together. So I was like, yeah, this is a really cool opportunity. Like if I can offset some of my costs. So it was like three, four months out, started preparing like, okay, what like a three hour block would look like, man, how am I going to talk for three hours? Now it's mm -hmm. like, you know, we go for four or five days without, yeah. without breaking and still have more to talk about. Uh, so that was how it started. So I went out and then, you know, one, one gym heard that I was hosting at another gym and like, Oh, you're going to come to my gym. And another one heard. So I did three seminars. Uh, I would have been like March of 2017. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I went out again the following year. And I, I, after I did, once you do one, people kind of see it like, Oh, that'd be cool. Like people yeah. follow you like, Oh, would you want to come here? So like I, I did a handful in that year and then just like local stuff around the States or in Canada. And then the following year back at the Arnold's, I competed again, and then I did nine. So I did nine seminars in Australia, competed Damn. in a span of about 17 days. So I went wow. uh, Sydney, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, back to Sydney, competed in Melbourne, and then, and then split. Damn. And then after that, it was like really started like, then it was like maybe once a month I'd be on the road, somewhere around mm -hmm. states in Canada, then going into 20... 2018 like latter half of 2018 i was i would say three weeks of the month i was on the road so i was you know around the states mostly did a couple more trips or back to australia mm -hmm. and then the end of 20 you know life stuff happens <laughs> at the end of 20 and then so end of 2018 I, I i was homeless um and i was traveling like you know i travel and like you know people put you up in a hotel or like yeah. they put you up airbnb and it's like all right that's kind of cool but when i was home i was sleeping in my car yeah. Or like sleeping in my office and I was like, fuck, like someone's gotta give. <laughs> so I had like about a two month span mm -hmm. where I had everything like everything lined up, like I was gonna be on the road for two months straight. Mm -hmm. So I was gonna go uh, I had a thing in New York, I had a thing in the Middle East, and then I had some stuff around the States and Canada, and then I was gonna be in Australia for a month and then I was like, All right, like I just I sold whatever shit I had left. Mm -hmm. I like got rid of my car. And I, I, I just went on the road and I, I, I've been on the road ever since, man. Like, <laughs> uh, I was like, I went to figure it out and I, I haven't stopped. I think I've stayed in since uh, what? It would have been November 2018. I've, I've probably stayed in about 60 or 70 Airbnbs. I've been, wow. I've done probably, I, I, there, I remember one specific, it was last September. I did 28,000 miles in two weeks. Damn. It's like Vegas, Detroit, Miami, Boston, New York, 
Manchester, Dubai, Sydney, Vancouver, <laughs> Ottawa, Toronto, New York. So I just did a full <laughs> whoop, one oh, spin so... around, and then I like got back to New York, and I was with my buddy, and like, oh, like, did you like were you training somewhere else for a few weeks? And I was like, <laughs> that's it's like a fucking movie, bro. It was like like a time warp, and you're like, oh, here, yeah, I just kind of took a break for a week. <laughs> It's been crazy, man. And now, like, obviously, with, like, being grounded here in Australia, it kind of changes the perspective on some things. But, uh, yeah, the traveling and the teaching has been cool. Like, yeah. just, just to, you know what, man, it, it's, it really, you, you, I don't, you really don't know something until you teach it. Yeah. Right. And, and that's sure. something like, you know, I, I, I teach a lot of coaches, but what I want to teach these coaches to do is actually teach them to teach. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, because if you can teach it, if you can teach it to a room of 40 people, you can explain it to one person in a session like that. Yeah. Like you, cause you have their attention. You're working with them. You can manipulate the body position. I need to express these little like detailed concepts mm-hmm. to 40 people, keep their attention sometimes for days at a time. Mm-hmm. So it's like, that's a, you want to acid test your knowledge base, like yeah. bring it on the road. Cause you know, you'll go, you man, I, 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 I teach and, and work with really smart people. Like, I'm sure you get to seminars sometime and like, you know, the ins and outs and you see, you listen to come people ask questions. You're like, man, this guy's dialed. Like, yeah. This guy knows it. Like this guy's, this guy's got chops. And it's like, that, that's kind of scary. Cause you're like, oh, like, like I have experience and, and evidence in different forms outside of research and things like that, that are hard to replicate. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I've worked with people that, you know, if, unless you've done that, you can't really say one way or the other, mm-hmm. but like. I think that for me is just integral and really understanding and like synthesizing and making sophisticated and simple this very complex thing. Because my first seminar, man, I was just like, just like all jargon shit. No one knew what the fuck I was talking about. (laughs) All they knew was like, yeah, this guy's kind of smart. But it's like, I don't I don't teach this to sound smart. Yeah. Right. I teach this for you to understand it and more importantly, for you to be able to apply it. Mm-hmm. Right. Like that's mm-hmm. why I do that. I don't sit up there and just like pat myself on the back for using big words. It's like yeah. I need you to like like I don't like you I like how you use the word dumb it down. It's like mm-hmm. I don't I don't I try not to. It's like I ask people to smarten up. Don't dumb down. I want you to smarten up. Mm-hmm. Like that's yeah. that's the point of this, right? Like I don't giving you all the answers. I'm asking you to ask better questions. That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well you're 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 one, you're giving them value, but you're also increasing their performance in that way. You know, is that like you got to kind of you kind of test them out in that way, you know, and, and, and see how they can progress through you. you got, it's not going to be given to you. You got to learn it. You know what I mean? And so it's perfect. Well, that's what I like with what you do, man. Like, because it's so hard to find people who are like, like original. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, and it's, it's a weird thing to say. And it's like I always find myself thinking about things that aren't really strength and conditioning related, but play so much into it. Like there's there's so many like like me and you look. Like if we ever committed a crime and we lived in the same town, we'd both end up in the police lineup. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Maybe it was number three. Maybe it was the guy on the right. I don't know. They're both just big white dudes with beards. Like I really can't. Hey, I don't know. Like, maybe if no one said anything when we committed the crime, they might get the wrong guy. But like, yeah. that's sort of the only. But like, there's so much. Like there's so much difference in like style. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. Like, like it's about having. Like so many people are so. They're so like they're a slave to the research. It doesn't allow them to be anything mm-hmm. but a vessel to espouse research. It's like, dude, have a flair, yeah. like have a have a thought that's your own. You know what yeah. I mean? And like that's something that's hard because like you know I teach people these concepts and then immediately they just go like regurgitate them back on a social media. It's like, okay, that's a start. I understand that, but you need to start to meld your own experiences, understand who it is you want to work with and create your own style around mm-hmm. training, right? Like mm-hmm. if you want to be like something other, like an original, right? You don't mm-hmm. want to be like a replica of something that's already out there. Mm-hmm. So that's like a tough thing to teach and try and teach that at the same time. Like, mm-hmm. look, like, you know, you work with, uh, you work with a handball population, right? Like mm-hmm. I, when I talk, I'm talking to a specific audience. I know that when I create content, I'm literally thinking of having this person in the chair. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm talking to this person, this avatar of what my consumer looks like. Mm-hmm. So getting clear on that, because it's just it's so hard to find people who are like original that their intent is not to just prove to be smart. Yeah. Plenty of people out there are smart and talk about it's like 
like have that critical thinking so you can actually apply it. Otherwise, like you're just glad handing yourself and like, oh, look how smart I am next to everyone else. Like, yeah. what's the what? What do you achieve from that? You know. So it's like mm-hmm. that's that could be a hard thing. And I think when people look at you, it's like it seems so cool. Like you're like the coolest guy in the fucking world. Like you talk cool, you look cool, you hang out with cool people, you do cool shit, you coach cool shit, and people like just want to be cool. Like yeah. so they just all of a sudden everyone starts to get like you know he's got like a, maybe like a two on the top. <laughs> he's got yeah. this guy who takes care yeah. of you. and it's like right yeah that's that's clean I like that Barbara's yeah. clearly not in quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, you see people start following you. It's like, what's going on here? Like, yeah. does, that, does that guy like? Is it? Yeah. Is that my? Is that like? I got what is going? But it's like, dude, like, have your own thing. Like, yeah. use your own experience. And that's what I love watching you because it's like, I mean, I'm such a fan and have been for so long. Like, that's this awesome, guy's man. just so fucking cool. And I watch it. I'm like, I'm like about to do an instructional video. I'm like, I just. I, I think I'm just trying to do something Phil did already. Like, oh, all right, I'll just do my own thing. Like, but it can be hard, man. Like, I because I got like, I mean, I got a shtick. Like, I got a rap. Like, I kind of know now. Like, I've been able to like acid test the stuff, and I kind of got my own curriculum and my thoughts and ideas in my head. But even I like look at someone like like you or my buddy Corey Schlesinger is another good example. Like you and Schles, like you both talk kind of cool. Yeah. You and like he's got a sick beard too. And like he does a lot of like plyo, elevating mm. foot stuff, kettlebell, and like I grab a kettlebell and I'm like, right, unless I'm doing a windmill or bottom under press, this is the most athletic fucking thing that's happening with this kettlebell. <laughs> put it down, put it down. You're gonna hurt yourself. You're not Corey. Like I th- I thought about like when I go to Toronto, like taking up boxing, just because like I would like talk to you like I, you know you just had. You just had Barbosa in there. I was like, oh, man. And I was like, that's not me, man. Like, I'm not. Like, if, I, if my fight isn't over in, like, three seconds, I'm going to die. Like, if I can't just one hit or quit or someone, Dude. someone with, like, a hockey haymaker, like, I'm fucked. Listen, when you come to Florida, we'll get the gloves on you. We'll make it work. Trust me. I got – and I got to – I have to get this on camera, by the way. I have to. Like, we're gonna do. We're gonna do a video. I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you some techniques. We'll hit the bag a little bit. I did that to. I did that with Encima, the the big uh, the big black dude that hangs out with Mark Bell. And honestly, it took us like five minutes, and he kind of got it down. You know, and with the athleticism, you would be able to make it work. Just with the athleticism. All right, that's good. I feel like that's that's viral YouTube video <laughs> material. Like me with the mouth guard in, like. With the headgear, I'm gonna be a smoke. I'm gonna get absolutely smoked. All right, we'll do it. I'll do it. Perfect, perfect. So, all right, man, this, I could talk to you forever, man. Um, so, what I'll do is I, I got two questions that I usually ask all the all the guests. Now, the first one, you can answer it whatever way you want, but I usually ask them, you know, what is your true definition of a strong person? Like, it doesn't have to be physical, it could be mental, whatever you think. Just give me some type of definition. Yeah, I mean, I think. For me, I always come back to like this, this, this dualistic relationship between strength and stability. It's like an ability to, and this could be like physical or mental. Like mm-hmm. you know, a, a lot of you know, you you go homeless at 28 as someone mm-hmm. who spent a lot of money on an education and and think you know what you're fucking doing, and all of a sudden you need to figure out whether or not you're going to drive to the grocery store and pay for gas and eat less food, or walk to the mm-hmm. grocery store, spend more calories, and be able to carry less food. Yeah. So it's like you know, I you definitely have some like conversations in some long nights when you're sleeping on the floor somewhere or like sleeping in the backseat of your car. So for me, it's like, you know, it's an ability to resist force and exert force, right? Like I think a lot of people, they, they want to be, and I'm me the same dude. Like, man, when I was, when I was homeless, I was strong as fuck. Are you serious? <laughs> like, you know, I was, I, you know, easy 700 pound squat, 700 pound pull, like, you know, 1900 yeah. pound total at 242. It's like crazy. that was my life. Like, but I had, dude, I had no ability like mentally to resist force. Like I was, I was a mess, dude. Like no, no point to be on paper. Sickest life ever. Like mm-hmm. kid made it out like a, you know, a rougher neighborhood, made it to California. I was living like my mom just loved telling her friends. Like, yeah, he lives like in this swanky hood. Like he works at this swanky school. Like he's got his own jam, but like, I was like, great, this all looks great on paper and I'm fucking miserable. And then all of a sudden I was like homeless and it, like I didn't have any, like, dude, I was having like panic attacks. I was talking to my girlfriend about this yesterday. Like I ended up in the hospital. My 27th birthday, it's my 27th birthday. 
He was my 27th birthday. I ended up one of my one of my clients was a he was a cardiothoracic surgeon at Stanford University, mm-hmm. and I woke up in the morning of my birthday and had like a panic attack or like an anxiety attack, and I thought I was having a heart attack. Wow. Like, I thought for sure like I, I couldn't see Damn. for like five minutes. Like when I came to like I was like drenched in sweat. Like I thought I had like uh, like ventricular hypertrophy or had some sort of like. Uh, like transient ischemic attack or something like that. Like mm-hmm. I thought I was, so I called him and he's like, dude, get in here right now. No health insurance, no nothing. He snuck me in the back door, did an echocardiogram EKG. Mm-hmm. And like, he was like, Hey, like you're good. And luckily one of my other clients was a, a psychiatrist and she was like, you gotta get your shit together. So mm-hmm. that was like a big thing for me. So like, I mean, I always bring it back to training cause that's the one thing I know the best. And it's like, you know, and when I look at strength and stability as, as two different things, it's like, you know, on the outward, I was like really strong, but like my ability to like, you know, handle adversity and stress internally was not there. So it's like, yeah. it's a balance of being able to exert force and resist force, right? Like I know some people who are like good at resisting force, but they're mm-hmm. meek, they're weak. They don't have, they don't have teeth, right? Like mm-hmm. they're that, they're that gardener in the garden. And it's like, all right, but like when shit pops off, like, what are you going to do? And other people are just so like, and like me, like I was so, you know, I wanted to be big and scary and I rolled with like, you know, like the strongest dudes and I wanted to have, and then I'll, on the back end, it's like, you know, there were some rough nights, man. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you put out this persona and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, you think you're going to die. So mm-hmm. that for me is my definition is like, you know, a balance and an ability to resist and exert force, I think yeah. makes like a strong person and people can take from that what they will. Right. Yeah. That's, that's in all aspects of life, man. Not just, not just in the weight room, but you got it right then and there. It's like, you know, you can literally look like Hercules, but in the inside, you're like Jane, you know, at the end of the day. And you got to, for me, like I always say, like I keep an even keel no matter what. So if I can, you know, take the good with the bad and like right now what we're going through, you know what I mean? There's always times where like, okay, man, this is pretty fucked up, but we're going to come out of this even better. You know, if you have that mindset, then it's, it's, you're ready to go. Sky's the limit. You know what I mean? So. But I think you have that, man. Like, I, don't, I don't. I think one of the things is probably was just, you know, like you said, anxiety. But now, look at you. You're successful. You know, obviously, you're living the life. You know, you just got to keep it going, baby. Just keep it going. <laughs> All right. So one more question. I'll let you go. Um, I always like to ask successful people this, you know, and you know, you know, tap yourself on the back. <laughs> so what is like? What is like your daily routine? I know like you do a lot of now you're doing a lot of podcasts, but like in general, what's your daily routine look like? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on the day, like with the travel schedule. Uh, I mean, I, I'm an up early kind of guy. Like, mm-hmm. you know, right now we're kind of get, we're getting up 545, mm-hmm. maybe 530 a.m. Uh, normal day for me is get up. We usually go for a walk, grab a coffee. So I, I travel and, and live with my girlfriend. Mm-hmm. So we get up, spend some time together. I'll, I'll glance at the inbox, see if anything's pressing, mm-hmm. um, get to work, kind of get the fingers moving on some, some emails, try and do some correspondence. I have some business partners in North America, deal with that. Mm-hmm. Um, once I get moving a bit, then get into writing content. Uh, I get a book coming out later this year. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So that's been a bit of a monster that I've been tackling for a bit. So write for a bit, go train, mm-hmm. um, come back, write some more, uh, maybe go for another walk make some dinner and I'm in bed by eight 30 and then we just hit the, hit the reset button. So, and, and obviously that changes. Like my, my normal week would be like, we try to travel on Mondays. You know, I'd usually post up in a coffee shop, work for four or five hours, go train mm. and go like explore whatever city I'm in. And then usually teach Friday through Sunday. But now my days are kind of up early, you know, get out, spend some time, spend nice. some time with a girl and then, then to hit the keys, man hit yeah. the weights and then just do it all again man it's pretty nice. pretty structured and i think like the biggest thing is having like contingency plans like mm-hmm. you know i need to a lot for you know like there's time for when stuff goes wrong like you know everyone keeps a real tight schedule but it's like you you need to literally block off for that in case shit because in case mm-hmm. shit happens you need to be able to like tap into it so it's ever evolving man and i think everyone's got their own jam when it comes to schedules for me, I build my schedule out around like creativity, which kind of seems like a weird thing. Yeah. Like I'm most creative at these times, mm-hmm. and it's like I need to perform tasks that, like answering emails, I don't need to be creative. But if I'm writing my book, it's like I write a lot after I train. Mm-hmm. I'm energized. I feel mm-hmm. good. I feel creative. I open my laptop. I was just like my book's about training, obviously. So mm-hmm. like I have ideas, and I just. <sighs> Yeah. Whereas I think some people might hear that and go like, oh, they hear my structure to my schedule. They hear your structure and they go, oh, okay. Like, you know, Phil hits, 
you know, he has his shake first and then he goes for his walk and then does this mm -hmm. and then rolls and then spends time with his kids and all that. Like, I'm going to do that. It's like, well, and he does that because he's the best version of himself to do that task at that time in the day. True. And that's something that is, should be ever evolving. So that's how I look at my schedule, man. It's pretty basic. It's pretty simple. But it's, it's really effective, I think. Yeah, that's super interesting because I was thinking about that actually last night. I was like, man, I changed it up a bit because I used to do a lot of my like self-education and learning in the morning. And I'm like, well, I'm more of a producer in the morning. Like when I get up, I'm like ready to go. But at night, I like to you know wind down and then I could be more of a consumer and really like read and things like that. And it actually puts me more at ease. So that makes a lot of sense, man. Like trying to find a way that works for you. It's like anything in life, to be honest with you. Just the same thing with training and everything else. So, all right. All I wanted to do was make sure that you got out the seminars, certifications, your Instagrams, all that stuff. Make sure that you let them know. Man, follow my man. Stop playing around. Stop following follow him up. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Instagram is at the underscore muscle underscore doc. So if you search just Jordan Shallow, I usually pop up. Uh, seminars, so we run a 16-week certification course online. So I teach live lectures. We average four a week. Now it's the same lecture taught four times because we, I mean, this semester we're, we have students in 17 different countries, I think. So overall we've done, I think in the, in the three or four semesters we've done so far, we, we've over, I think we're over 25 or 30 countries. So to appease for time zones, I teach, you know, each module four separate times. We'd run that across 16 weeks. Um, and then we, 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 we open up a new semester after that. So we're in, Right now, we're about a quarter of the way through our summer semester. We'll open up next semester certification for sale mid-July, and we'll be good to go for um, about an early to mid-August start, and then we'll run that right into the end of the year, into December. Um, so that's our that's our, our big course that we're running, obviously, online right now is the mm -hmm. only course we're offering. Uh, if things open up, we we'll still have a tentative to be in K. Um, I'm going to be in Killarney, Ireland, early July, Killarney, uh, and then I'm going to um, Manchester and Nottingham. So we're going to spend the majority of July, hopefully, fingers crossed, in the UK. Um, and yeah, that's really about, that's really it, man. Any questions or anything, like uh, my website's themuscledoc.com, or you can shoot me an email, jordan at themuscledoc.com. All right, man. So again, make sure you check that guy out. He's, uh, he's phenomenal. Jordan, thanks again, man. I appreciate you coming on. Dude, appreciate you having me, man. It's been awesome. All right, brother.